I was born and raised in Jamaica, Queens, New York. It's a real hotbed of, of music, of inspiration. John Coltrane lived in Jamaica, Queens. James Brown had a house in Jamaica, Queens. I mean, I remember going to John Coltrane's house as a kid because my mom and dad were friends with him and Naima. So we would, we would go over there and hang out. I must have been around five or six years old. My uncle purchased for me a little toy drum as a holiday gift. My dad, after that, purchased a real snare drum for me. I actually still have that snare drum. It's a black lacquer Ludwig snare drum. And then by the time I was 10, I started playing gigs with my dad's band. Uh, he changed the name of the band to include uh, Omar, the 10-year-old drum sensation, which I thought was really <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> I was like, do we have to? It's too much pressure. <laughs> But it was during that time period that I met Nile Rodgers and we had a local band together that actually used to play at Great Adventure Amusement Park. Bernard Edwards used to come to the park and hang out with Nile all the time, you know? And so they were talking about Chic even then, you know? And so when we finished our stint at Great Adventure that year, Nile and, and Bernard said, Omar, we're getting ready to go to to Paris, you should come with us. We're starting a band, we're going to Paris. I had just gotten accepted to music and art high school in New York City. So I said, no, I don't wanna be a high school dropout before I even get there. So you guys have fun in Paris, I'll see you when you return. Well, the next thing I heard from them was on the radio. <laughs> you know, all of the, the, the French influence on the band was evident with the, the name Chic, Chic and the, right. the singles like Le Freak and, yeah. and all of that right. stuff. So, of course, you know, I kicked myself a few times for, for not getting on the plane with them. <laughs> this is just a small piece of it. Yes. The best of cool the guy, yeah. Curtis Blow, the brakes. Break it up, break it up, break it up. <laughs> the Bowie connection came from Nile, from my old friend Nile. David had enlisted him to, to produce that record. The idea was to use the chic rhythm section initially to, to record those tracks. Um, but something was going on with, with um, Tony Thompson and Bernard Edwards, and they weren't able to, for whatever reason, make those early sessions. Uh, I don't remember the details, but I do remember getting that call and being very excited about it because I love David Bowie. When I get to the power station in New York City, the first song that we recorded was Let's Dance. That's how the session started. Oh, shoot. Here it is. Here it is. And I remember the drum sound being very unusual. The engineer, a guy named Bob Clearmountain, had this uh, Ludwig Black Beauty snare drum that was part of the studio stock. Like back then, recording studios had their own drum set stock. And he had taped some uh, small contact mics to the rims. And, you know, he was, he, you know, he was doctoring. He was cooking something up. <laughs> Bob Clearmountain, right? He was cooking something up, man. The genius. The drum pattern in Let's Dance was, uh, was really an imp improv that we organized. You know, typically with pop records, the drum beats are like two bar patterns, four bar patterns. Let's Dance was an eight bar pattern. And we really worked out, it's very subtle, but if you go back and you listen to the two phrases, you'll hear that it's really an eight bar phrase. You know, and I think that that gave it an interesting foundation. In the late 70s and early 80s, there's a, a recording studio construct that had been operating with a group of people that had been used to making records a certain way. And the role of the drummer inside of that construct um, had a community of drummers very, very busy. There was even a segment of the work called uh, the demo session. Roger Lynn changed everybody's life when he dropped the Lynn drum because a lot of those writers then understood, wait a minute, I don't have to bring in a bunch of guys to do the demo. I can actually work up the demo with these drum machines and these sequencer products that allow me to hear the idea before I do the final session. So, all, so now, 1979, 1980, things are starting to change, <laughs> right? And what I would say about it was it scared the crap 
out of a lot of people that weren't ready for the change. change. Okay. But I'm 19, 20 years old. Yeah, yeah. I'm new in the game. <laughs> I'm looking around, I'm going, well, hold on. What is that box called? Let me write this down. <laughs> Save up some money. money. I'm going to Manny's Music on 48th Street, New Manny, York City. Yes. And I'm going to buy me one of these things. I'm going to reprint all of my business card. And it's gonna, now going to say drummer and drum machine programmer. <laughs> And then I'm going to rip up those old cards. Here's the new one. <laughs> and, that, and, and that's where my journey began with technology. Wow. wow. I was actually using drum machine as a part of my writing process because I just like some of the, the crazy sounds. You know what I mean? So what I would do is I would program beats hit play. And then I'd sit down at the drum set and play with that and record all of that stuff. My process now has come full circle because I'm, I find myself sitting at acoustic drums a lot. And, and even for an artist like Daft Punk, for instance, um, when they called me, I thought, knowing what I knew about their music, that my collaboration with them was going to be more on the electric side of what I do. But the robots were like, no, 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 no. We want you to play acoustic drums. Really? Okay. Acoustic drums it is. Tomas, he had a keyboard rig set up and he had ideas for bass lines and grooves that he just wanted to jam on. So he would play a groove and it was myself and James Genus on bass for those sessions. We would jump in, find a tempo, then we'd set the click, play again, but we might play that groove for five or 10 minutes. I never heard Get Lucky in the studio. Basically what we were doing was we were creating a rhythmic song construction kit at the studio of original content rather than pre-formed loops. These are loops that, that, that they were making right there that they could at that point use and cut up the way they want. So it was interesting. Yeah, we're going to get a live drummer. We're going to get a live bass player. We're going to jam. We're going to let this do what it does with the humans, <laughs> but then we're gonna take it back and we're still gonna kind of apply our production concept to it. And I think that that's what made it unique. There were already companies out using drummers to create loop content for all of the various DAWs that were out there. And initially, I wasn't interested in doing it, initially. Instead of doing it in a studio space, if I would make it very personal by doing it in my home space. You know what I mean? Where I'm really comfortable, where, you know, again, I've had a studio for years. So now I'm, I'm giving, I'm, I'm creating something of value. Uh, and I wanted the people that invested in this, uh, this loop pack to feel like they were actually in the room with me. I think that's what we, we captured. Like I went into a restaurant the other day, a vegan restaurant in New York City. There was a DJ there and um, she played something that I was on and the, I knew the bartender. So the bartender said, oh, like that's, that's him. He's the drummer on that. So we started talking and she was like, well, whoa, I didn't, oh, you're Omar. We were introduced. And she said, you know, I've been using your loop loft stuff at home, you know, and, and she talked about this feeling of being in the room. So when she said it, I was like, mission accomplished. accomplished. Exactly. <laughs>